Hey guys, welcome to my new YouTube channel. This is Matthew Harrison. And what we're gonna be talking about today in video number one from your request, which I've got on the poll here, uh, we're gonna talk about some limits of the EEC4 as they pertain to tuning Fox body Mustangs. A um, Couple other videos that we're gonna do right behind this, as you can see, are gonna be tuning for boost and talking about you know mass airflow sensors and some of the stuff that people are still for some reason talking about these days uh, that, that needs to sort of be squashed. Uh, there's just a lot of really strange knowledge out there. Uh, now, the limits of the EEC4, when I think about these, there's, there's kind of some different categories and I've, I've jotted down a few notes of some things I wanna cover here. So there's, there's some hard limits that there really is just nothing you can do about. I mean, the, the, the EEC4 is what it is and no amount of hacking and tuning and trickery is gonna get past some of these things. So there's sort of a category of some of those topics. Uh, there's soft limits that, while there are technically things that the computer won't let you do, there are some pretty simple tune-only tricks you can use to get around those, uh, or some uh, extra hardware that you can sort of attach into the system to get there pretty easily. Uh, these things are still within practical limits. Um, so not something that I would just say, don't do it, it's impossible, whatever. Uh, and then the third category is stuff that, you know, a few of these things have been done. There's some, some really talented programmers out there that have invested a lot of energy in digging all the way down into the rabbit hole and, you know, coming up with some solutions for some of these things. You know, Ford in a couple cases left sort of some open-endedness in the hardware itself to do a few things. They just never really put the attention into the calibrations and never made it something that shipped from the factory. So there's a couple things you can do with some, some actual uh, wiring changes, uh, resistors, you know, some other things like that. But things down in the third category, generally, uh, if, if you really feel like you are at a point where you need to do a lot of these things, that's where you're probably needing to look at something else. You know, you've, you've probably gone past the practical limits of the EEC4 and you need to look at some of the more modern standalone systems. Uh, so here's sort of some, some general categories. And, you know, while I understand a lot of these topics have been covered on forum posts and Facebook groups and everywhere else over the years, a lot of times when I see people talk about this, there's never visual aid to go along with these things, and most people are visual learners. So my goal is to actually use the software, click through these things, and rather than just talking about it and hoping you, you know, take my word for it, I want you to see what I'm talking about. So also, if you go in and want to tune some of this stuff yourself, you, you have a real idea of where to go. Uh, okay, so the hard limits, you know, per cylinder fuel trims, these things are set up for bank one, bank two. So basically, you know, left side, right side of the motor, four cylinders on each. And that's kind of how your fueling is controlled. Uh, there's just really no way around that that I've ever seen. There's nothing you can do on a per cylinder level, uh, like you'd see in a lot of the more modern systems. So, you know, is it that big a deal? Eh, you know, for most of our combinations, not really. But I'm not aware of any workaround for that. If anybody knows of one, I'd love to hear about it. I, I don't think you can do it. Um, Wideband closed loop fuel control. So closed loop fuel control is basically where the, you know, the computer's asking for a certain fuel requirement. Something happens, there's some combustion, the, you know, uh, the emissions go through your, your oxygen sensors. The computer understands, hmm, what did I get out of that? it adjusts and then the loop continues. And so it's constantly sort of shifting things a little rich, a little lean and, and getting you what you want. Uh, and of course the, the factory setup does that with narrow band sensors that can't read uh, too far away from stoic. Now, the more modern stuff like my S550, it comes out of the box with wide band sensors. And so what that means is even when you're in wide open throttle and you're going uh, intentionally into some areas that are uh, richer than stoic, it's still able to read all of those conditions and continue to, to self-adjust and give you what you want. Never seen it done with one of these. I'm not really convinced that it can be done, uh, but it's, it's not really that necessary. As long as you also have a wide band in addition to, or uh, instead of those O2 sensors, you know, you can do your own data logging. You can adjust the tune accordingly. So, uh, you know, but natively, no, you're not going to have support for that. Per cylinder spark control, again, uh, some of the newer stuff, you can you can make some minor timing changes uh, at the per cylinder level if you want to. Uh, not really a way to do that here. Now, the CPU clock speed, you know, I don't know that this is super relevant for most of us, but this is the actual rate at which the computer is able to make mathematical calculations, 
I believe it's 15 megahertz for these, which, uh, you know, in the 80s, uh, that's, that's kind of what we had to work with. It's very slow by today's standards, but uh, that still can get a lot of work done. Now, why does this limit matter? Well, it's kind of related to the next thing, you know, the more RPMs you're running, essentially the more calculations you're asking the computer to perform within a given amount of time. And that, that window of time it has to get those things done is continuing to shrink the faster your RPMs climb. So you will reach a point where it's just trying to do more than it can and there will be consequences. I mean, ultimately you just can't finish the calculations and performance is gonna suffer things can just really kind of fall apart at that point. So uh, from everything I have ever read, I've never tried to push the EEC4 past around high 7,000 RPMs. Uh, again, you know, yeah, the engine itself, if it's built well, can do that. There's lots of guys running into the, you know, eight and 9,000 RPMs with the small block Ford. But a lot of those guys have race engines. They have a lot more money tied up in these things. And again, you're either carbureted or you're into a more modern standalone. So uh, I've never personally pushed one past 8,000 intentionally, but all the research I've done suggests that this is a hard limitation that you're gonna start having problems around there. I don't think this is an issue for most of you, but keep that in mind. Now, the soft limits, this is the stuff where we're gonna jump into the software now, and I'm gonna show you where these things are and talk a little bit about what we have to do to sort of work around these things. Now, some of these uh, justify sort of their own video. Um, and the next video I'm gonna do is around tuning for boost. So this first one where we're talking about sort of what's the, the mass air limitation, this is one of the, the big considerations you're gonna have to make when you're tuning for boost, as are these two right here. Uh, so let's jump into the software and look at these. So we're gonna start with the mass air meter. So. What I'm talking about here is when you're setting up your mass air transfer, you have uh, some numbers you can plug in at different voltage points. So you're essentially reading from zero to five volts and you're telling it at each one of these points that you've set up, what's the airflow. And of course, then the computer knows how to adjust fuel accordingly. So when we jump over here to binary editor and we look at our mass air transfer, this is the stock uh, Fox body A9L configuration. So this is basically a, a, just a five speed five-speed uh, mass air car. And you can see that at each of these voltage points, you have an amount of airflow. And you can see that this pegs out in the low 800s. So the thing is, you know, when you're getting into a higher horsepower application, you're putting in a bigger mass air meter, that mass air meter is specifically designed to flow a lot more air and to still be able to accurately read those higher airflow numbers. So if I open up a different tune to compare this to something like, uh, like a turbo car, you know, here's something where we've got uh, just a blow through math, but it's one obviously designed for, for you know, seven, 800 horsepower. And you can see that these numbers are jumping way up in here, uh, close to 3000. And of course there's even bigger ones than this that'll get into the four and five thousands. And while the system will physically let you put in numbers as high as 20,000 kilograms an hour in any of these cells, the computer can't handle that. It can't read it, it can't make use of it. And so the computer, as I've put in my notes here, this is the practical limit of the computer where it no longer understands how to read numbers that are higher than this. So what will happen, let's say you have the tune like this and mine actually goes higher than that right now. So let's say that I'm, I'm boosting this thing and I'm pushing it all the way to the ragged edge of what this mass air meter was designed for and it hits 2350 or higher than what? Well, I, I've seen this limit hit before and what I've read is that either the computer resets or that it just runs lean. Now, I don't know that I've ever seen a computer reset. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what that would even look like. Um, I've never seen like all the sensors just shut off or the car shut off or anything crazy. But what I definitely have seen is things start running really lean. It basically quits enriching, but you're continuing to climb and boost and airflow and it's not adding additional fuel. And it's almost like there was just a brick wall right there with its fueling. And, and of course you're going to run lean. And if you're really running lean at the absolute top end of, of your power curve with you know boosted application that's that's not good so what you have to do is there's some trickery i'm not going to do it in this video this will be in our next one around boosting but there's ways that you can trick the computer by telling it that the cubic inches of your motor is different than it actually is and in doing so you can divide these numbers by uh, sort of a ratio of your choosing so all that really means is the numbers you're putting in here 
are actually lower than what they really are, but the tune still works and everything's still okay. And there's a way to do that. So there's a, a pretty straightforward way to get around this. Uh, and this is called math scaling. And we'll, we'll talk about that in this next video. So that's, that's a limitation. Anytime you get your mass error that you go buy, you know, if you buy them new from Pro-Am or, uh, you know, any of these other reputable manufacturers, they're going to give you a calibration sheet that comes with that. If you see numbers in that sheet at the top end, bigger than 2350, just know that if you're actually going to read up into those numbers because you support the airflow, you're going to have to make changes here. Okay, injector size. Now, the first thing I want to say about this for, for guys that are a little bit newer is that when you go buy a set of injectors, you know, they're always rated, right? You, you buy a, a 19 pound injector, a 24 pound, a 30 pound, a 42 pound, a 60, an 80, a, you know, whatever. Now, when, when you see what those are rated at, there's a couple things to consider. Number one, those, that pound quote unquote measurement is at a given fuel pressure uh, that the manufacturer of that injector is suggesting. That doesn't mean that's what you're running. So on a factory uh, Fox setup, you would be running at 39.15 pounds of pressure if everything's perfect, which I mean, that's, that's a very, very specific measurement. Of course, no car will be set exactly to that, but it'll be close unless you've modified it, of course, with, uh, with an aftermarket regulator. So, you know, the first thing to say is that whatever number they give you may not be exactly what you'll plug into the computer. It's really just a starting point, and it assumes that you're going to run your car at the fuel pressure they designed that injector for to get that pretty close reading. The second thing I want to say is that let's say you're running something like, uh, like a DECA 80-pound injector, a Ford 80-pound injector. Well, even though that's the rated number, you actually have two different numbers you have to plug into the tune. You have high slopes and low slopes. And so the high slope is really what you're talking about when you talk about what's the injector rated for. If they say it's an 80 pound injector, what you're really saying is the high slope is probably gonna be about 80 pounds. But the low slope, which is sort of what's leveraged when you're not asking the injector to do a lot of work. So when you're idle and you're at really low load uh, areas, the injector behaves fundamentally differently and generally puts a lot of extra fuel through the injector and it almost behaves as though it's a larger injector until you start asking it to do a little bit more work and then it behaves more uh, regularly like it is rated at. So this is a limit that the computer will not physically let you put in a number larger than this for the high slope or the low slope. So if we go down in here to the fuel section, uh, we can jump in the injector you'll see those two numbers right here, your high slope and low slope. So again, factory Fox, which is our left column, had 19 pound injectors. So that high slope is you know, about 19. You notice that the low slope's considerably larger. Well, over here on the right, this is uh, my tune that I've got here with a DECA 80. And it was right there on the ragged edge. It's very, very close on the low slope to 112.50. And that's the biggest number I can put in. So it gets me close enough to where I can make a very, very fine adjustment in the mass air transfer uh, in those, those lower cells, and I can get the tune where I want it to be. But if I was running absolutely any injector bigger than 80 pounds, I'm going to have to do, again, more, more trickery here. It's, so the idea, again, that same type of concept I talked about where you trick the computer by telling it your cubic inches of your motor is different than it actually is, that can also allow you to come in here and change these numbers by a similar percentage. So if I told it, uh, you know, things were, were a 50% difference in my cubic inches, so instead of a 302, I'm, you know, half of that, then I can come in here and I can adjust these by that same percentage and I give myself more working room, everything's still going to work fine. So again, in that tuning for boost video we're going to do next, this is something we're going to cover in a, a very specific way. So just know that 80 pounds is about the limit of what you can do before you have to resort to uh, those specialized techniques. But I will say this, guys, I have personally on, a, on an EEC4 uh, run a car with 200 pound injectors and I was told it cannot be done. Uh, I was told the injector drivers can't handle it and some other things kind of more on the mechanical side. Uh, it, it worked fine. I, I, I mean, again, there's, there's trickery in the tune itself, but no custom code, no hacking hardware, nothing crazy like that. Didn't have any issues. So uh, just know that you can run some really big injectors. And I'll be honest, if any of you out there are trying to do things to the point where you need to run extra injectors, like two injectors per cylinder, or 
you know, you're getting into three and 400 pound type stuff. You're not using a stocky EC4 anymore. You guys have gone well past uh, anything you should be doing here for lots of other reasons. So that's your, uh, your injector limitation. Okay, load reading, 200 pound max. Now, what we're talking about here is, you know, load, if you think about it this way, just to sort of overly simplify things is, you know, when you are not with your foot on the gas pedal, you're just sitting there idle, you're not asking the engine to do much work. You're not putting a lot of load on it. So the load measurements are gonna be pretty low. And as you lean into the pedal harder and harder, the load goes up. And of course, at wide open throttle, you don't have a flat curve. It's not like you're gonna hit a certain number and then it's just gonna stay there through the RPM range. The load on the motor is gonna change as you reach your maximum torque, and then you continue on past that point uh, in the RPM curve. So, uh, you know, that, that's whatever it is. But what you need to understand is that the computer cannot register numbers higher than 200, no matter how things are set up. So when you have a, a bone stock Fox body, let's, I wanna show you guys something, this is interesting. So there's something else in the tune where you're, it, this is used for fueling, but you're trying to tell the system, you know, at different RPMs, when I'm at wide open throttle, what's the maximum load this engine is likely to reach? Uh, at various RPM points. And that's something that you see right here. So basically in the factory tune, you're saying at 1000 RPMs, 67.5 is the biggest load we're gonna see. Here at 71.5 load, and you can see at 3500 RPMs, which is about peak torque, that's where you're gonna see the highest load. And then you notice that when you get past the, the top of that, that torque curve, things start to go down. So at 5000 RPMs, we're only at 79 load again. And so this is kind of what, you know, Ford from whatever research and testing they did, this is where they put these numbers. So this kind of gives you an idea of what a stock car looks like. So going from a, a bone stock Fox to something with just some basic bolt-ons, you know, maybe a small cam, some small aluminum heads and intake, you know, just the basic top end bolt-on type stuff. I usually see these numbers go up a little bit from here, but usually not even to the point where you see a hundred load uh, at any point. So they're gonna be still relatively close to this, but they'll change a little bit. So that's a naturally aspirated car, you know, stock or with some small bolt-ons. You know, you're still probably not gonna see more than 100 load. Now, where this becomes important, this limit of, well, it can only read up to 200 load is when you have boost. And, you know, if you're running like, so let's say you're running like a bone stock engine and you just put on like a little Vortex supercharger and you go run their little, uh, you know, six or, seven, eight pound package, you're still not gonna hit 200 loads, so you're still okay, not a lot of trickery there. But for you guys that come out here and you know you wanna slap an on three kit on there and you wanna turn it up to you know the 11 pound spring and then open up the controller all the way and go run 20 pounds through it, I mean, you're, you're gonna go well past 200 load. And the way I like to think about this is, you know, you, you think about the way, you know, uh, pressure works and, you know, this is approximate, but just to make the numbers easy, but for about every 14 pounds of boost you put on there, you're sort of doubling the potential output of the motor. Again, there's other factors here I'm not gonna get into, but that's close. So when you think about this naturally aspirated motor here, peaking out at 85 load, and let's say I ran about 14 pounds of boost through it, it's probably gonna be about double that. So again, you can see where this is gonna cause you guys problems where you, you already have higher than 85 loads because you've maybe got some bolt-ons, then you run a ton of boost through it on top of that and you run into issues. So what happens when you get to 200 loads? Does the world end? Well, no, but the thing is you, you're losing your ability to control things in the tune because the whole point is, you know, as your boost climbs, your load is gonna climb. And as boost goes up, you generally are pulling more and more timing. So what's gonna happen is if you can't adjust for that in your tune, when you go past 200 load and it's maybe still trying to go up to 250 or 300, you can't pull any more timing. So the only way to keep things safe is you're gonna to have to pull however much timing you needed to pull at the very, very top end of your power, which is 250 or 300 load. You'll have to pull all that timing all the way down at 200 load. And so you're basically that sort of area under the curve, you're, you're killing your power potential there and that's not what you wanna do. So again, the same sort of hack that we keep talking about of manipulating your cubic inches of your motor to, to represent something it's not really, that's the kind of stuff you do that allows you to trick the system. The load actually goes down 
the reading that it thinks it is, is going to be a lot lower than what it actually is. But now you stay under 200 all the time. And because of that, you have the adjustability in the tune. And the biggest place that this is really going to affect you is the timing table. It also affects fueling, but that timing is the thing that's really, really critical on these boosted applications and where you want to make sure that you're, you're not being too conservative or that you're not doing anything stupid and you end up, you know, popping a head gasket or even worse, you know, you, uh, you know, you pop a hole in a piston or something like that. So if we go down into the, uh, the spark tables, you know, just to kind of show you something quickly, you know, up top, this is again, this is stock setup. This is this table. And you'll notice that the top row in here is at 75 load and at 4,000 RPMs. If I didn't do anything to this table at all, other than just change what are my timing numbers in these different cells, you know, that's going to be terrible for boost. I would essentially have to put whatever total timing I want in this row. And I'm just totally squashing all the mid range on this motor. It would be terrible. If you look at this one down here, this is just kind of something slapped together for a baseline on a turbo car. You notice that these go all the way up to 200 load and 6,000 RPM. So now you notice I gain all this area right here to tune that I'm really not going to get in the stock timing table. So I can continue to adjust as boost changes uh, and RPMs change past 4,000 and above 75 loads. So this is the stuff we're talking about. Uh, and again, if you're running a lot of boost, you're gonna have to do things to trick the system so it never exceeds 200 loads so you can still work within these, uh, these parameters here. Okay, now this is another one of these, these things that it's like, it's not a deal breaker, it doesn't totally break anything, but you know, a lot of these tables that you have, fueling tables, timing tables, there's lots of tables where you can adjust lots of points in these cells, just like this timing table you're looking at here. And the thing is, while you can change for these tables what these these different values are for the sort of the row or the column like i can change these rpm values if i want to have different rpm points and you can see i've done that down in this tune and i've changed where the what the load is at each row for this tune but i only get so many rows and so many columns for each table as ford designed it and there's nothing i can do about that so one of the things you you're going to find yourself doing sometimes is deciding well what what rows are really important? What columns are really important? Which ones are not so important? And you have to really think through what you're doing here uh, when you tune this. So as an example, you know, when I set up my timing tables for basically anything that's even has enough bolt-ons to require a custom tune or, or benefit from a custom tune, let's face it, guys, once you turn the key and the engine's running, there's no scenario that's healthy that you're ever running less than 500 RPMs. This column to me is completely useless because I, I just should never be running anything that causes that. Now, depending on the combo, you know, I'm not one of those guys that thinks that every little bolt on should be, the car should be idling up at, you know, 900 or 1000 RPMs or 1200. I see a lot of tuners get really lazy and, or, or people that just don't know what they're doing and they'll, you know, they have a lumpy cam and it idles like crap. So what they do is they just turn up their, their idle RPMs and, then it sort of smooths out and everything's happy. And I mean, at some point you have to do that a little bit. I mean, you're not going to put some, you know, 650 or 700 lift cam in there and go idle at 600 RPMs and be happy. But I also don't think you need to be at 1200 RPM. So, you know, depending on the combo, then I might even drop the 700 row and go into something more like eight or 900. But, you know, the point is by killing this, I've now freed up a column. I can shift everything over one and I can now have maybe a 5,000 RPM or a 6,000 RPM. Uh, and so again, it's, it's about, you know, making some decisions as to what's important and what's not, what are you really benefiting from and what are you not? And then changing uh, each axis accordingly so that you can better use what the, the cells that you have available for various tables. So again, when we go into that tuning for boost, uh, we're actually gonna sort of set up a, a, a dummy base tune for kind of a common boosted combo. And we're gonna specifically go in here and change all this stuff. So we'll see what I'm talking about there. Okay, logging extra inputs. So when you wanna data log with a quarter horse and, and binary editor, this is what the data log screen looks like. So you'll go in here, there's all these different parameters that you can turn on or off that you might wanna log. Uh, and then ultimately, if we were plugged into the computer or into the car, we hit the start button, it would log these things, we can go look at the log later. Now, the thing is though, these are based on logical inputs that the computer had stock, things like air temperature. 
engine temperature, uh, you know, your mass air meter, your load measurements, your fueling, your, your injectors, your oxygen sensors, you know, stuff like that. But obviously, it's not meant for all the weird stuff you might bolt into the car. You know, if you want to measure the, uh, the drive shaft speed, well, they didn't have that on here. So, you know, what are you going to do? Even if you want to do something as simple as add a wideband sensor on top of this, and then you want to log the wideband so you can really see what your fuel's doing, you know, under boost or a wide open throttle, you've got to do something to handle that. Now, there's a hack, and I'm going to make a video specifically for this. And this is probably the, the single most common uh, wiring hack that I see guys do and I actually recommend for most combos. If you're in a state that you don't have to deal with emissions and I'm fortunate enough to be in one of those states. I'm in, uh, in the 405 here in Oklahoma. Uh, we, don't, we don't have emissions uh, regulations at all. So, you know, one of the first things most guys do with the Fox body, there's very few cars left with this stuff, is they kill the EGR and all the emission stuff, clean up the engine bay, you know, simplify things, fine. One of the things you gain from that though is the factory by default does have a five volt signal that comes back from the EGR telling it uh, where that EGR is at a given point. And as soon as you've killed the EGR, basically what you just did is you allowed yourself to have a free pin that comes into the computer that's a five volt signal. Well, guess what? A wideband's a five volt signal too. So guys will go in and there's a way to hack, uh, hack into that, splice into the wire by the computer and uh, the kick panel and wire the analog output of your wideband directly into that. Uh, and then there's a way to tell the system that you've made that change and now you can log it. And that's how we end up with something that looks like this. You'll notice that even though this still says EGR valve position, you notice that my tag is called AFR and this is actually telling me uh, you know, what my wideband air to fuel is now. So when we're talking about logging extra inputs, as long as it's something that's five volts or less and you are not using the EGR, this is, you, you get one, you have like basically one freebie that you can tap into that, that pin and you can bring a signal in and, and set that up accordingly. But that's about it. Um, all the other sensors, honestly, you need. So even though there are other sensors you could do kind of the same thing with, you need those sensors. You know, you don't want to lose your air temp or your coolant temp or the other stuff uh, that, that's important. It's there for a reason. So you get one. And again, for most bolt-on cars, Wideband everybody should have. I mean, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, even even on a, a stock combo, I mean, it just it, it's such a good tool to tell you what's going on with the health of your car, and it lets you see things faster than you otherwise would. You can catch problems earlier. It's, it's just a good thing to have. But again, you know, you get one. So if you want to do more stuff like that, like maybe you want to have uh, you know a dedicated oil pressure and you know some some other third party stuff. Really the only way to do that is there's something that you can buy uh, that'll sort of add on to this system. It's called a super logger. And you can see it right here. It's 200 bucks. So, you know, it's not crazy expensive, but it's not cheap either. And I know a lot of guys are working on a budget and hell $200 just to have the ability to log more stuff. You know, that's, you know, that's 200 bucks that you could spend on something else that makes you go faster. Uh, but this is the big thing you got right here. You have eight inputs that are five volt inputs and you have a, a switch uh, for a few of those. So if you have anything that, that is a, a sensor that reads higher voltages, this will sort of trim that down by a third so that it doesn't blow up the circuitry and you can continue to log that stuff too. So this is sort of an add-on thing that if you really need to wire a few extra sensors that you want to check, you know, you want to put shock sensors, whatever it might be, uh, you know, you, you can add this component into your system and then you can wire those additional things. But again, if, if you really are at a point where you have to have that to, to have a good system and get the things you want. It's more reason that you're talking about probably wanting to go to some kind of other more modern standalone system and, and ditch this all together. But it is here, it is possible, but it, this is something that actually requires a purchase. Okay, so that's kind of what logging extra inputs looks like. Now again, this one, uh, you know, the, the faster computers that you would have in modern cars or new standalone systems, when you're doing data logging, they can give you more information per second. They can physically check the readings of all these values more times a second and give you uh, a much more detailed view of things. This is a hard limit. There's nothing we can do about this, but when you're in this data log screen before you turn this on, you'll notice down here at the bottom right, you have the data logging rate in milliseconds and the lowest number you can put in here is 10 milliseconds. Uh, now, honestly, it, 
that's pretty fast. And I've never let this stop me. This has never been a huge problem. Uh, the, the default setting in here uh, is 50. You know, I'll usually set this to about 20 uh, when I'm logging things and it works well for me. And I get the amount of detail I need to make most decisions, but you know, newer stuff will run faster is at the end of the world, not really, but you just have to know it's a limit. There's nothing we can do about it. You can turn it down a little bit from this default setting, but that's as good as it's gonna get. But again, it still provides a hell of a lot of detail uh, when you turn that down a little bit. Never been a huge deal breaker for me, but you just need to know you, you, you're not gonna be able to log anything faster than that. Uh, and then this is kind of the last one is, you know, doing like custom electronic uh, dash gauges. So you can do some stuff. I mean, I'm not saying this is what you would ever wanna do, but let me show you what you can't do. So when you're in binary editor, you know, you've got this thing plugged in, it's, you've got the laptop in the car and you know, you're plugged in and you're logging. You can go to this dash view and there's, and you can set these up. There's, you know, there's out of the box, there's a couple different views. You know, this is what they look like. And of course these gauges would all be, you know, doing stuff in real time while the car's running. But uh, you know, you could theoretically customize this dash. You can put whatever parameters you want. You, there's different gauge styles you can put in here. And you could find a way to, you know, maybe have more of a, a Windows tablet type thing and you could stuff it in your dash somehow that was the right size. And I don't know, you could maybe cobble something together that didn't look like total shit. Uh, maybe not, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen anybody do it, but it's possible. I believe there's also uh, an Android capability here as well uh, that's a little bit newer. I've never used it. Uh, but, you know, you could, you could put something together here. But there's not a whole lot of flexibility in this interface with, like just aesthetically the, the appeal of wanting to look at it that you'd be real proud of if it was sitting there in your dash. Uh, there's, there's a lot more cooler and more modern uh, gauge setups with, with other stuff. But, you know, it's another one of those things. Some guys want that. Um, you're going to be pretty limited with this setup. So just, just keep that in mind. But it's just a looks thing really at that point. Um, and, and most of the stuff that you'd really gain from having such a granular look at your stuff. Let's, let's face it, man, you can't stare at all these different things all the time while you're driving the car. And anytime you're doing a data log, once you've saved that data log and your, your pass is over, your tune session or whatever you're doing, when you go back and play that, you, know, you can play back the log and you can stare at these screens now when you're not in the car and see real time playback, either from this view or from just the raw data view and, and you can look at that stuff. So. Uh, you know, it, it's something you can look at. And of course, you also have a chart view. Uh, and this is what you're going to spend a lot of time with when you're when you're looking at that stuff. So you'll, you'll go in here and open, you know, whatever, whatever data log it is, you'll see all the different things that you've chosen to record, you can turn these on and off, zoom in and out and sort of set up the layout how you want it. But, uh, you know, this stuff is all here at your disposal as well. So that's really what you're looking at for those limits. Now, I'm going to kind of go through these quickly. But just kind of put a couple things out there. So in this different category, you know, knock sensors and fan control and launch control. These three categories right here, Ford does have some parameters that are available for you to change uh, as it relates to these particular things. Uh, but the wiring's not really all there. So, you know, most of these cars, especially a Fox body, like it doesn't come with a knock sensor. So can you install a knock sensor on the block? Yeah, you can. Uh, if it's the right knock sensor, can you wire it into the computer? Yes, you can. And if you do that, is there something you can turn on that, that allows you to, to read that? Yes, there is. But, you know, how much value you're going to get out of that, I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's something technically you can do. Fan control, you know, this has been around for a long time. Um, you know, these, the Foxes, as you know, they came with uh, mechanical fans. One of the first things a lot of guys do is they'll, you know, underdrive pulleys and slap an electric fan system on there, which, of course, I'd recommend electric fans all day long but most fans come with their own controllers as well and their own thermostat uh, to control that and everything else. But there is a way to, to do this with uh, the factory setup. You just have to run an extra wire in, pin it in, uh, and there's a couple things you have to do. So, you know, these, these couple guys right here, there's definitely some, some ways to make use of that. You're not writing a bunch of custom code. Uh, some people have more success with this than others. The rest of the stuff in here though, uh, has it been done? Some of this has been done, but you're talking about really, really advanced stuff. I mean, you're talking about actual software programmers hacking the core binary code of this thing to make it work. Uh, it's just, again, there's, 
you're getting to a point where, I mean, if you really think you need low impedance uh, injectors, you want coil on plug ignition, you want to run a progressive nitrous control, you know, you're either using standalone units kind of bolted on top of this. Uh, so like additional things, just controlling boost or just controlling your progressive nitrous or whatever, uh, or you've just abandoned the EEC4 altogether and you've gone a different direction. So two-stepping, uh, coil on plug, progressive nitrous boost control. I mean, this is pretty common stuff that guys want now in higher performance applications, but uh, just expect to use third-party add-on boxes or just to go a standalone system a totally different direction. So, you know, this is really the limits that I see uh, from, from everything I've worked on. Uh, and most of the stuff can be worked around. And again, for most practical cars that are still even at a point where trying to use this this 30 year old computer makes sense, you can probably work with what you got and you're not gonna be too disappointed. Maybe throw a couple add-ons if you're a nitrous guy or you want a two-step or something like that. Not a deal breaker where you need a standalone system. But you know, when you guys are out there trying to go run, you know, 1500 and 2000 horsepower and you know, 40 pounds of boost and 500 shots and all this other stuff, I mean, let's face it, you've, you've got so much money tied up in the entire system that going to a standalone and paying a professional tuner you know, to dial this stuff in, it's, it's worth doing. And you've, you've definitely exceeded, uh, I think, what, what this is designed to be used for. So that's video number one. I'll get this stuff out there. Next thing we're going to do is a detailed walkthrough where we're going to build a base tune for a boosted application, starting with a bone stock tune. And I'll show you all the specific things you have to do in order uh, just to get to a point where you can turn the key everything should be good and once you get your math and your uh, injector data kind of dialed in with basic tuning you know you you have the fundamentals there to go ahead and lean into it do some logging and see where you are but you shouldn't blow anything up and it should have a, a safe start there and then i'll also make another real small video where we're going to talk about uh, mass air meters the this concept of a calibrated meter uh, and, and you know the other things that we need to do there so uh, thanks for watching and uh, i'll get another one out here for you guys soon